but it's your show. Indeed, it is my show, and we. Except, I want to ask you a question. Yeah. This is a special segment that we are are uh, springing on you, the host of this program, on the sperm of the moment, and it is called Stump Brian. (laughs) Because I have a question that I want to ask you. And that was, was going to be my wrestling name if I ever lost a limb. Stump. <laughs> but anyway, you have a question, I understand. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll tell that one to the one legged waitress <laughs> over at the IHOP. <laughs> but anyway, um, I have a question I want to ask you. And you might know this in your infinite wrestling knowledge, in your, in your minutia that you have committed to memory, that you have thrown into the medulla oblongata portion of your brain. You might know this, but then again, you might not. And I'll tell you either way how I think you know it or how you might have not known it after I ask you the question. The question is, Brian Last, the great Brian Last, what was the first televised instance of a World Heavyweight Wrestling Championship changing hands. The first televised world title change. The first time that a World Heavyweight Wrestling Championship changed hands on television. Okay. I don't know the answer off the top of my head, so I'm just going to try to give you some of my reasoning as I try you're, to figure you're gonna it out. Work, you're going to yeah. work this out. It's, it's, hey, it's who wants to be a millionaire, only I ain't giving you a fucking million about dollars, so go okay. ahead. Okay, I could be wrong, but I'm going to start with 48. 48 is the birth of the NWA. 48 is really when TV starts the beginning of its infiltration into America, which completely takes hold by the, by the early 50s, mid-50s. So we're going with NWA. We're not going with National Wrestling Association. I don't remember ever hearing about Fez and Hutton. I don't know about Pat O'Connor and Hutton. Rogers and O'Connor is a yes. That's 61. So now we're trying to figure out that something happened between 48 and 61 for a World Heavyweight Championship, which is what you just said. Now, technically... Everything you have just said so far is correct in the way you are grasping this question. Technically, the AWA World Heavyweight Championship between Don Eagle and Gorgeous George would have been televised. That would have been 49, 50? And that was in Chicago. That's Chicago. It was a double cross. And that was uh, pretty much everything they did in Chicago land in those <laughs> days was televised. That's right. But that ain't it. That ain't it. So it's before that. I don't know. Okay. On television. Hold on. Yeah, I'm just trying to trying to think of the semantics of the actual question. On television, world title change. Obviously, no AWA at that point. No WWA at that point. No WWF at that point. You have the AWA, a different AWA, obviously, uh, centered out of Boston. You have the National Wrestling Alliance. You still have the National Wrestling Association, technically. Trying to think how many regional world champions still existed in the late 40s, early 50s. It was kind of the end of that period of time. Did Fez have have a title change air before that? I don't know. Well, 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 actually, 57, Fez and Carpentier is a title change. That aired. I know you can go into the whole story of Carpentier's claim but that is a title change match so you could yeah. say that one and that's a world yeah, but, but, title but you've just established here just moments ago that don eagle and gorgeous george was technically right. a world title change and was aired on television that's why the film of it still exists let me ask you one question since obviously i haven't gotten it what city did it come out of well that 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 would well that that actually wouldn't even be telling you i don't think But I will go ahead and give you that. If you beg, I want you to beg, Brian Last. I want you to beg me. Tell me if it was St. Louis. Oh, Jim Cornette, I'm dying to know. I've never begged for anything. I can't start now. How about just say please? Will you please tell me? Okay, St. Louis. St. Louis. Televised in St. Louis. 
I, I give up. Okay. Folks, on the experience, which is my show, by the way, on the experience this past week, we talked about how that our friend Scott Teal at crowbarpress.com has issued a three-book series of St. Louis wrestling programs that uh, he was able to work together with a young man named, well, not he's not young anymore, none of us are young anymore, but a super fan from Japan named Koji Miyamoto who actually got <clears throat> these um, programs left to him in Jim Melby's will, who Jim Melby was an old friend of ours and a great wrestling fan and historian and writer and et cetera in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Till he paid. When he passed away in 2007, he willed these to Koji, and Koji's now worked with Scott Teal to publish these in book form. They even predate the... St. Louis uh, Wrestling Club, Sam Muchnick's bound set, the office set that I was able to acquire from Pat O'Connor's wife when he, when he passed away. They go from 1943 through 1951, and it's not complete, um, but a, a, quite a few of them. He's published these in three books. Uh, you can go to crowbarpress.com, and we talked about some of the incredible attendance figures and how Wild Bill Longson was the forgotten guy in the 40s. He was the biggest box office attraction in wrestling and still is in the top five. And that uh, over 58 events that he main evented in a three-year period in St. Louis, he sold 573,000 live event tickets. So an average of 10,000 people per show every time he appeared. In some cases with the smaller houses also came the he sold out the Checker Dome, the uh, the old arena, a couple of 16, 17,000. Well, I'm into, and Brian, you can identify with this. I'm into the segment of the books that now it's a duplicate of what I've had in my office set. And I got those in 19, what was it, 1991? Uh, whatever year Pat passed away, Harry White hooked it up for me. And that's the point is I spent time when I was off. I had left WCW and was setting Spooky Mountain Wrestling up, but I went through these programs in depth 30 years ago. But you got to remember that there's somewhere around 2,500 to 3,000 pages of these programs in my set. And being as it's a one of a kind, that's why I'm saying you can identify, being as it's a one of a kind unique collector's item replicable nowhere or available nowhere else in the world. I don't just fucking haul these things down and flip through them, put bookmarks in them, put post-it notes in them and, and shit. Right. I'll give you an I, example. Okay, I have a mint condition set of Florida programs from issue one, uh, when they read the championship wrestling, which I think is what? 69. Oh my God. Mint condition run of the first, uh, whatever, 40 issues or so. I just got a second set that was pretty busted up. So I had one that I felt okay with flipping through because the yeah. <laughs> the paper of those programs is so weak that I kind of yes. don't want to touch those mint ones until I absolutely have to. So it's I got a second news, set. Newsprint kind of stuff, right? It's even cheaper. I don't know how to describe it. It almost <laughs> becomes like flaky, the paper, if it's exposed too much. So, but I bought a but second set is. so I could access the data. Yeah. This the, Scott doing this has encouraged me to, when I get some time in my old age, to go back and with modern eyes look at all of those programs again. However, I, I've, I love Scott's work. And by the way, folks, and he's done a bunch of more modern books as well, but crowbarpress.com. We're going to have him on to talk about some of these things coming up. Um, but I don't feel bad about flipping through these and putting the bookmark in at night or falling asleep with it on my chest and bending something, right? Because it's it's very nice reprints, but they're reprints. But I want to read you this because this is the kind of thing that has almost been lost to history, lost in plain sight. Because it, 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 as we as we do more research in the modern day of the history of wrestling facts like these become more important and more, and just more cool. Also, this is from the program 
Sports Pointers, dated Friday, March 7th, 1947, but it is talking about... 47? 1947, but it's talking about the previous event uh, that was at the uh, Keele Auditorium on Friday, February 21st, 1947. And, wait a minute, was this the Keele or the fucking auditorium? God damn it, hold on now. And part of it is... Even when you've got the originals of these programs, they used really small print. Yeah. But the point is, Bill Longson, Wild Bill Longson, lost the National Wrestling Association World's Championship to Whipper Billy Watson. Wow. Who was uh, a, who had a couple of runs with the NWA title, but was the biggest. Well, that's who Bret Hart always compared himself to as a Canadian wrestling hero with Whipper Watson. He was the guy, and he was drawing the huge houses in Toronto, and he and Longson, I think, uh, drew several houses at Maple Leaf Gardens of over 15,000 people. So since St. Louis and Toronto were so hot, they did a title change that would do draw business in, in both places. But anyway, here's the thing. This is the article from the following show's program. KSD TV cameras record historic moment. Harold Grams presides as Kingpin is dethroned. The first word, as well as the actual picture of Wild Bill Longson in defeat, was carried by KSD TV, St. Louis's first television station. Harold Grams, familiar to sports fans throughout his daily sportscast over KSD, was at the microphone to inform the world outside that the monarch of grappling had toppled from his throne. Little groups huddled around television receivers in downtown hotels, offices, stores, and homes saw the historic upset as it happened, when it happened. It was pure coincidence, of course, that radio's dream come true, quote-unquote, that's what they call television, was on hand when Longson's reign came to an end. Yet television proved on its very first test with wrestling here that its potentials are unlimited. So this was apparently the very first, and it's buried in, it's a quarter page article in a program in fine print. That was the first time wrestling was televised in the city of St. Louis, Missouri, when it had already been the hottest live event attraction in St. Louis of any sport or any event for like the previous 10 years. Anyway. And actually, on. just a little oh, note ahead. here, KSD went on the air in 47. So this is right after the first television station went on the air. Yes. Uh, the article go, Whipper Billy Watson's victory over Wild Bill Longson was the greatest wrestling news in over four years. The fans here who had waited through 87 consecutive matches Longson had had were thrown into frenzied excitement when the finish came. Just think what would have happened in Toronto, Watson's hometown, if it had been possible for television to transmit the sight and sound of his victory to there. The time is not too far distant when all of us will have ringside seats at every major sport or a spot news break and sporting event, regardless of where and when it takes place. Television is here. The experiments you are now witnessing in St. Louis tells of the many wonders ahead. Cables are being laid to make possible nationwide television. And with a matter of months, coast-to-coast -coast experiments will be conducted. Within a very few years, network television will be as common, as effective, and excellent as the radio programs you now hear every day. Some experts say television pictures will be presented in lifelike color someday soon. If you're inclined to doubt it, just remember, skeptics once said that the automobile would never replace the horse. Wow. 47, you see, I knew I didn't think it would be an NWA alliance title it's a, change. It's a trick but, question because yeah. nobody would think that something like that happened in in the 1947 when television mostly was experimental and there were so few receivers. But they had just gone on the air and they were obviously because of the the attraction that wrestling was in St. Louis, they're saying, well, we'll try this out. And I'm sure somebody tips somebody off that, well, we're going to do something big. But what do you think? Do you think would five? I, well, I don't know how many people because they said that they were gathering around, you know, television sets and offices and downtown in stores. We've seen the pictures from Japan 
when they didn't have television 10 years later, when they still mostly didn't have TV of those giant screens that they would gather by 10,000 in the parks and squares to watch Ricky Dozan. But this was more like an early version of, you've heard those stories in New York City in 1948 when there were just starting to be like, what, 1,500 televisions in town, and you'd have people trying to peep at other people's windows or standing out blocking traffic out in front of the appliance store. Uh, but that the first major world championship in wrestling changes hands on a local experimental TV broadcast in St. Louis, Missouri. That's one of the tidbits you get when you buy these books, folks. I love this shit. I had a question in my mind, so I went looking for the answer. I don't have it precisely, but my question was, here it is. First TV station in St. Louis, big broadcast. Was Kinescope around yet? And it looks like it actually debuted or was widely available, a form of it, in beginning in late 47, so it may have been after this. I'm just thinking, is there any chance any surviving footage of this exists and no one knew where to look for it? I... I... I would almost But if there's think, no kinescope, what's the chance? Yeah. Yeah, and 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 for for the young folks who still re don't remember when you had to dial a phone, kinescope was the process of there was no videotape. In the early days of television when you broadcast a a signal, a show, it was live and you couldn't record the feed. So what you did was you sent it to a monitor and with a film camera you recorded the television program the video and the audio off the monitor which was called a kinescope and not only is that why we've got the lost honeymooners episodes and a bunch of stuff not the 39 classic season 55 56 but the earlier ones from gleason's variety show but you've also got a lot of early television news and sports and things that's it's the flickery thing that you see that that's was called a kinescope and that's actually how, before they got what they call it, the transcontinental cable laid, they would send television programs, what, for the first year or two of TV, and maybe more if it was not network, from the East Coast to the West Coast on a kinescope to show later on because there was no way to transmit it all the way across. That is but where the surviving footage of the Graham brothers with Bobby Davis and Johnny Valentine's first interview returning to the Northeast that's where that footage comes from. It's kinescope. Yeah. So that, the, but the question that you asked is, would it still be there and nobody knew where to look? I highly doubt it because as, as tied in as Sam Muchnick, Bill Longson, Luthez, everybody involved in the St. Louis promotion was with uh, the the local TV and uh, stations and radio and et cetera. And they're always in the programs plug because they were having radio broadcasts. If you go back and look at those programs of, yeah. of the, that's how they promoted before television was radio because they were doing so such incredible business that it was worth it to do radio remotes and or wrap ups of the, uh, the, the cards. And they'd talk about it on the sports segments on the radio news which was the equivalent of TV news, except they didn't have TV yet. Um, somebody would have had that. Somebody would have seen it. Somebody would have known about it. Somebody would have said something. It would have been shown on some retrospective. Uh, so I, I would have a feeling that it's just, it's it went out to 500 TVs in St. Louis and however many people it could huddle around them as a harbinger of things to come. Yeah, I guess the best case scenario would have been if it was something that they also sent to Toronto, but but see they the they weren't they weren't there yet. They because couldn't do it, it. Yeah, it wasn't film. It was te if they'd had a it, well. But here's the thing: when's the first TV station that went on the air in Toronto? What would they have done with it? Watched it in their fucking living room if they sent them a film. They couldn't show Good it question. to anybody. Good question. Right, look that up in your fucking Google machine there, young Brian Laugh, while I take over your program. Because that's the thing, if they had filmed the match, then we would still have it, but what would they have done with the film? They were doing an experimental broadcast in conjunction with St. Louis's first TV station, that's how they got this deal hooked up anyway, and part of the deal was that the TV station was checking their television broadcasting equipment, not a film crew. 
So they broadcast it all right, just nobody saw it. But if they had shot a film there in February 1947 in St. Louis and sent it to Toronto, what well, what would they have on the side of that? What's that big, the sky, not the sky dome, but the space needle or that big needle in Toronto? Are they going to put a sheet up on the side of that and, and show the film on the fucking wall? How would they have shown it to people? And I can't find a firm answer. Uh, the first Canadian stations signed on in September 52. But that seems really late. No, it doesn't. And I'll tell you why, because I've done a little research on this before. Um, you would be surprised at how late some places in Canada got television. You'd be surprised at how late some places in Europe got television, as opposed to the United States. Uh, that's not uh, out of the realm realm of reason at all that the first TV station in Canada did not go on the air until 1952. We're, we're willing to be corrected. But it's it's not a glaring situation. And there were still TV stations in this country. There are markets that did not have television stations, some of the smaller markets, into the late 50s. Well, Jim, I know a lot of the listeners want you to keep the history coming on these shows. and I, But it's your show! And I so. also know that a lot of listeners may want to keep their hair. <laughs> How's that for and you? And they're tearing it out of their heads right now trying to keep up with us. Well, folks, if you want to keep up, as Brian said, with your hair, then for heaven's sake, you need to know about our friends at Keeps. Um, I, 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 We've given the statistics before that a, a large majority of, of gentlemen, especially our age, uh, experience some hair loss and male pattern baldness and all that type of thing. But folks, if you go to Keeps, they can help you keep what you've got and even bring some back that you may have kissed goodbye forever for. And it can't grow hair on a billiard ball, but it can definitely help rejuvenate the follicles in your head. Um, if it's easy to be delivered to your home, you don't have to go out and have a doctor looking at your head with a microscope. It's prescription medication. The uh, the very discreet packaging and generic versions of some of that expensive stuff. It works just as good. But anyway, they offer a simple, stress-free way to keep your hair. Virtual doctor consultations and medications, as I mentioned, delivered every three months. You don't have to leave the house. And treatments start at just $10 a month. Proven results. They've got more five-star reviews than any competitor. But prevention is the key because treatments can take four to six months to see results, so you need to act fast. And what you can do, if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to Keeps, K-E-E-P-S, Keeps.com slash J-C-E to get your first month of treatment for free. Keeps.com slash J-C-E, your first month free at Keeps.com slash J-C-E. Brian, I, I think it'll even work for you. Even though I've I understood from Mama Cornette, she always said that hair won't grow unless you have a very fertile mind, which means a head full of shit. Hence, I have lots of hair. 